Thanks for inviting me here today. I'm going to spend the next 20 minutes or so going through the sorts of things about CDM that are useful for structural engineers to know. And the way I thought I'd do it was tackle it as six questions, first three in terms of the context. So what do we mean by a health and safety offence? Where's HSC taking enforcement action? What are the implications of getting it wrong? And then spend time on understanding CDM, so thinking about what our responsibilities are. In particular, what we need to understand about Regulation 9, where the designer duties are. And also, what if we need to take on the principal designer role? So first of all, I just wanted to touch on what do we mean by health and safety offence. And quite often people can think the offence is with somebody being injured or killed. It isn't. It's actually concerned about the failure to manage the risk to health and safety. So the HSE doesn't actually need proof that the offence caused any harm. The offence is actually creating a risk of harm. And I guess the obvious one is where HSE visits a site, there's some dodgy scaffolding, but nobody's on the scaffolding at the time, the contractor will get a prohibition or improvement notice because there is the risk of harm. And what I'd like to do is spend the next couple of minutes just thinking where HSE's taken enforcement action, just so you can get a picture of where things are going wrong. And there's been very few prosecutions of designers over the last 23 years. So I thought perhaps the best source of information was to look at the enforcement notices because there's a lot more of them issued each year. And what I've done is looked at the notices that were issued in 2016-17, which was the first full year of CDM 2015. And you can see that the notices were really issued for three key areas, the Health and Safety at Work Act, Work at Height Regulations, or CDM, and about half the number of CDM compared to Work at Height, sorry, Health and Safety at Work Act. I think what's also interesting to know there is the ratio of prohibition notices to improvement notices. On the Work at Height Regulations, most of the breaches that are seen on site will involve the work being stopped immediately with a prohibition notice because the risk is viewed so high. Also looked at it in terms of the individual regulations. And you can see, and I guess it may not come as too much as a surprise, that it's heavily dominated by principal contractors getting notices for in particular planning, managing, monitoring and coordinating there are a few in terms of what we might call the more engineering risks, things like excavation collapse, and then part four contains structural stability and excavations, electricity. And thirdly, I would look at it in terms of which duty holder has the duties. And you can see here, right down at the bottom, of the... 1,700 or so notices that were issued, five were issued for principal designer duties, two for designer duties. And if you look at them in a bit more depth, the principal designer ones, most of those actually went to clients for not appointing a principal designer. And the two designer ones, it's not entirely clear what role the duty holder did take they had several notices, but it didn't look like it was what you might consider as being a design consultancy or design practice. So in terms of enforcement notices, there's very little being issued to designers at the moment. I just want to touch on now what the implications of getting it wrong are. And... You may be aware that 2016 new sentencing guidelines were introduced and one of the sort of key drivers of that is that sentences should be sufficiently substantial to have a real economic impact which will bring home to both management and shareholders the need to comply with health and safety legislation. And the key words there 
for me, a sufficiently substantial and real economic impact. And if an organisation is found guilty, then sentences are based on culpability, which is the degree to which they were responsible, the level of harm that people were exposed to, and company turnover. So the larger the company, the larger the fine. And in the first year of the sentencing guidelines, there was quite a noted or notable increase in the fines. The largest fine rose from 1 million a year before to 2.6 million in the first year. And medium-sized companies were now getting fines that only larger companies were getting in the past, typically those in the hundreds of thousands. And the other significant change was a lower threshold for custodial sentences, that it's either immediate jail sentences or suspended prison sentences. And that's something that typically affects uh, contractors, site managers and directors. And what we were finding was that in the first year, one in two of those that were found guilty were getting a custodial sentence compared to one in three the year before. And just to give you an indication of the sorts of numbers you could expect for fines, now, in a typical construction case, it would be medium culpability and harm category one or two. And what I mean by medium culpability was that systems in place, but they either weren't used or weren't used properly. And the harm categories one or two mean that there was a high severity and or high likelihood of it happening. And for the sort of organisations that are in the room today, you'd likely to be in the micro category uh, with less than two million turnover. For a harm category one, you're looking at fines of 60 to 160,000, which would make a fair impact on any business, I would imagine. Now, since I prepared the first draft of this talk, HSE released a press release a week or so ago about the first principal designer to have been prosecuted and sentenced. There's not a great deal of information in the public domain at the moment about the exact circumstances, so I've had to rely on HSE's press release for it. And it seems that concerns were raised about lack of controls on a large timber frame extension to a residential home, and so HSE inspectors visited and found a variety of breaches on site, including falls from height, fire slips, uh, wood dust, and in particular there was concern about the risk of fire spread and the fact that it might expose 80 physically or mentally impaired residents. And so charges were placed against the architect acting as principal designer in relation to their principal designer duties. They actually pleaded guilty to breaching the principal designer regulations, got a £20,000 fine and ordered to pay 6,000 costs. And that fine, they would have probably got a 33% discount for pleading guilty early on before it went to trial. So it would have been a 30000 fine in the first instance. I don't know the exact size of the architectural practice, but I would guess they're in that sort of micro end, the less than two million. But by way of contrast, the principal contractor was, all, was found guilty in their absence, and they ended up with 150,000 fine. I spent a couple of slides now thinking about what responsibilities structural engineers have, particularly as designers. And first of all, think of it in terms of an organisation. The main responsibility in terms of health and safety is the Health and Safety at Work Act and Section 3, which relates to not exposing non-employees to risks as far as reasonably practicable. You've then got the Corporate Manslaughter Act. If something goes wrong and senior management were perceived to have 
taken actions that have caused the problem. And of course, for smaller organisations, it's much easier to plot a line of action between what senior management do and what might happen later on. You've got your CDM responsibilities, and I'll touch on them later on. Then you've also got responsibilities under Management of Health and Safety Act, which that's the source of requiring you to do a risk assessment. Then obviously the duty of care to others under common law for reasonable skill and care and contractual responsibilities. And if you're wondering why the right hand side of this slide's blank, that's for individual responsibilities. And they're actually a lot more significant than people might initially think. Uh, everyone under Health and Safety Work Act has duty under Section 7 to take reasonable care for health and safety of themselves and others. And if you're acting as a director, you've also got director duties. And the director duties kick in if the organisation is found guilty and the director has taken actions that are one of the causes of the problem. And although we refer to it as director's duties, it's actually wider than that because of the difference in job titles these days. It's really people that are t in a reasonably senior role got accountability taking those sorts of decisions. These can result in quite serious uh, sort of fines or jail sentences. I, last year I worked as expert witness for defence teams for a contractor site manager that was charged with gross negligence manslaughter and Section 7, he was found not guilty of the gross negligence manslaughter but got six months suspended jail sentence, suspended for two years for the Section 7. Also worked for uh, the principal contractor's director who was found guilty of the Section 37, got seven months suspended sentence, suspended for two years. So there are some fairly hefty sentences out there, and the Sentencing Council are consulting on extending gross negligence manslaughter to be compatible with other forms of manslaughter, and they're talking about sentences of up to 18 years, whereas at the moment, cases, sentences are typically a sort of year or two. Their individuals also have say, the CDM duties, the duty of care, and duty to employ it. Having gone through the context for health and safety legislation, CDM, I'd just like to switch over to CDM specific now. And I've, been, I've seen a couple of presentations over the years from HSE where they set down what they're looking for from CDM. And in particular, in managing construction projects, they're looking to integrate health and safety into project management they're looking at project being more than a construction site, which is obviously very relevant today for designers. The CDM talks about standards to be achieved, but doesn't say how to achieve them. It also gives, it's a flexible framework. So approaches to compliance will vary, perhaps in proportion to risk and complexity. But the point I wanted to make here is that risk doesn't really respect project size, even on the smallest sort of domestic refurbishment, you've got risk of collapse, falls and the like. And the other point I wanted to make is that although it talks about standards to achieve and not how to achieve them in a flexible framework, although that sounds appealing in one way and it gives flexibility, in the other way it does leave a little bit of a grey area in terms of how you might comply and how you know you're complying, which is something I want to try and address in following slides. So I'll spend a couple of minutes now talking about Regulation 9, which is where the designer duties are. And I don't expect you to read this, Regulation 9. You've you probably all read it many times in the past anyway. I think what's important is what does this mean in practice rather than the legalese that's there. And we're talking to people on the Institution of Civil Engineers Health and Safety Panel, and they've been 
looking at this area and grateful for them to for let me use some of their material here. And what they were thinking is actually you can break it down into three principles. Firstly, <coughs> designs should be safe to construct, maintain, operate and decommission. And in doing this, it's reasonable to assume, for designers to assume that these activities will actually be undertaken by competent people and organisations. Secondly, designs should comply with contemporary industry practice, unless there's a good reason not to. And thirdly, information on significant residual risks should be passed to those who need to know. So I'll just go through each of those separately. The first one, design should be safe, construct, maintain, operate, is really about eliminating and reducing risk. And one of the ways to think about that is that the majority of design decisions on a typical project probably result in what we've termed here as standard work tasks. And what we mean by that is it's things that are relatively standard for yourselves as designers, standard for contractors to <coughs> build and you've got common construction processes that contractors are familiar with so although they're not risk free the risks are well known and there's accepted methods of doing them and for instance uh, in situ concrete frame that's the sort of thing that you would expect a competent frame contractor to be able to deal with. Though it's not risk-free, he would understand how to deal with those risks. So for something like that, there wouldn't be much action required on part of the designers other than to recognise that there are these standard parts of the design and then record the decision that it's a standard part. But then obviously the other half is that there'll be the non-standard bits, those that would be difficult to use or adopt practice or when none exists and that's really where the CDM effort needs to be put and probably think well, what would make something non-standard so if we consider the in situ concrete frame example a standard frame on a greenfield site no problem but if there's lack of access to construct it norm using normal methods or temporary instability issues, for instance, cantilever slabs needing extra prop in or slabs unable to take predictable temporary loads during construction, perhaps because they're relatively thin, then these are the sorts of things that would make it non-standard and the contractor would need to be informed about them. And the second point about contemporary industry practice, there's actually quite a few <coughs> examples out here. I wasn't planning to go through these in detail as you'll get copies of the slides and I've put the links there for you to get hold of copies if you haven't already got them. But one I did want to just quickly know, the bottom one, the um, cross reports that structural safety produce, the, the confidential reporting system on structural safety, these rely on engineers to send in information on any particular concerns they have either on projects they're working on or that they've seen in their day-to-day sort of -day work. These will then be considered by the cross-panel, anonymised and a sort of commentary discussion put onto the cross-website for solutions. And also each quarterly a uh, newsletter will be emailed out with the latest reports on it. They're very good in that they've, they take a lot of difficult situations and suggest useful way forward. And I gather that there's an iPad circulating around at some point that if you put your email address in there, then it will make sure that you're on the circulation list for the cross-reports. <coughs> 
I've also put this slide up as well. Just There are a few um, paid-for documents as well as the free ones on the previous one. And in terms of the third principle about significant risks, I think the point to make here is that we're talking about significant risks and not high risks. In most construction projects, there's a lot of high risks there, but if they're obvious to competent contractors and designers, they've accepted ways of management, managing them, then they're not significant risks. So what we're after is those that are not likely to be obvious, the ones that are unusual or difficult to manage effectively, they're the ones that need to be communicated. So for instance, if there's assumed construction sequences where you're removing walls and they need to be taken out in a particular order to maintain stability, <coughs> or there's unusual loading arrangements like a precast beam that needs propping in its intermediate state before it's cast in, or if there's any other known unstable conditions. And perhaps a way to think about it is, if I were working for a contractor, would I be happy with this information or would I want a bit more? And that's one of the ways of thinking about what you need to supply. And you might have seen this acronym ERIC before. It's just a quick and easy way of remembering your duties. To eliminate, reduce, inform and control. And then for the last part of the talk, I just <coughs> spent a couple of minutes talking about principal designer role. And as a matter of interest, could you have a show of hands how many people have actually acted as principal designer? <coughs> also about 10%. Or so. And how many of you come across principal designers regularly as part of your day-to-day -day role? Perhaps not as many as you. HSC might have hoped for. <laughs> Don't you play that? But it's worth asking. And I, same as the Regulation 9 duties, I just wanted to break it down into what does this mean in practice, and particularly for those who are not doing the role regularly. So you're really there to assist the client in identifying and obtaining pre construction information, making sure that information gets to other designers and the contractors. <coughs> the perhaps more the difficult one, ensuring other designers comply with their duties and cooperate with one another, leads with the A's with the principal contractor, the important point for the duration of the appointment, then prepare a health and safety file, and if you're not there to the end of the project, that would then be handed over to principal contractor. And in terms of the documentation, uh, a couple of them, the pre-construction information and health and safety file are obviously set down in the regulations themselves, but others that are useful, the client brief, which ties in very much with what Christy was talking about a few minutes ago, it's useful to understand where you stand. Also, doing a resource schedule and associated fee, as well as the commercial side, from the CDM side, it helps demonstrate, both for yourself and the client, that the PD role is being properly resourced. And the other main thing is a schedule on significant residual risks. Now, this is useful for keeping track of the residual risks on the project, how they're being dealt with, who's, been, who's dealing with them, when. And it gives you a good way of demonstrating that you're discharging your duties to plan, manage and monitor the um, design work. It also gives you a means of demonstrating that you're helping ensure other designers are complying with their duties because you've got records of the risks having been dealt with. And the APS, the Association of Project Safety, do helpfully provide a free template for that. And just to slide on some of the pitfalls and how to avoid them, get clear what's an agreement about when the role's concluded because you might not be there for the whole of the project, so you don't really want the liability to last that long. And for, particularly for domestic jobs, it could just be at planning, building regs, or tender stage. The right to confirm when the role's finished, but also state that the client needs another principal designer 
if there's going to be more design work during the construction phase. Uh, no, I always say for all duty holders, keep a diary, day book, file notes. It makes uh, life so much easier if something goes wrong that you've got contemporary notes. Maintain regular contact with other designers. That helps uh, A, get things done, and B, demonstrate that you are keeping the, or ensuring the other designers are doing their duties. We talked about the risk register on the previous slide, and then with the pre-construction information, I would suggest look at the Appendix 2 of the old CDM 2007 ACOP. It's actually got quite a decent list of what needs to go in there. It's far more comprehensive than what's in CDM 2015. Well worth using. And then as a final slide, just for summary, really with CDM, what we're trying to say is keep it simple and looking for eliminating, reducing risks, pointing out significant residual risks, making sure that there's an information flow and focusing on outcomes rather than complex forms or procedures. In the same way with Regulation 9, we just think about it in terms of the three principles rather than the legalese of it. And then provide information on if there's a need for temporary works or assumed method of construction. Things may be obvious to yourselves as designers but might not be so obvious to others. And thanks for listening. And I'll be around all day if anybody's got any other questions they want to have a chat about lunchtime or in breaks. Thanks for listening.